inform you about the new uh, funding opportunity from Global Fund on C19 RM. It is being organized jointly by Stock TB Partnership and USAID, uh, and in collaboration with other colleagues uh, and Global Fund. Uh, so we will have a number of speakers here from uh, uh, Stop TB, from uh, USAID, and uh, from Global Fund. Um, uh, I am uh, Sahu Suvanan Sahu from Stop TB Partnership. Um, uh, I will uh, uh, try to moderate uh, the presentations and discussions. Uh, there is a chat function that uh, you all of you have. Uh, we would encourage your comments and questions through the chat. That will be a more efficient system because we will have people who can respond to the chat questions immediately. And some of them we can also take at the end for discussion. So to start, uh, we have uh, Luchika Dityu. Uh, from uh, Stop TV Partnerships is the executive director. So, uh, 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 Ricarda, if you can play uh, uh, Ruchika's video. Thank you very much uh, uh, for taking the time to be with us. Uh, a, a large number today, 82 or 83 colleagues. Uh, and uh, we are very pleased uh, to have uh, such a large representation from the national TV programs. Um, as we said, uh, you will hear this message reinforced a few times or several times uh, uh, along the day. Uh, we did this in a, a full uh, partnership and uh, great, uh, I mean, uh, absolute engagement from our colleagues from USAID, uh, Washington, as well as um, in countries, uh, with a very big uh, desire of ensuring that we as a TB community and the country programs, uh, less we in Stop TB, but, uh, or not at all us, but the country programs, the NTPs uh, and so on, are benefiting from this amazing opportunity uh, generated or funded mainly by the US government, $3.5 billion that went to Global Fund, specifically for the development, uh, for the support of C19RM. This work is also, uh, you know, we are we worked with our colleagues from USA, but in amazing partnership with our colleagues from the Global Fund, Ellie Wood and his team, as well as Mark Eddington and the others uh, there that you will hear from everybody today. I just wanted to clarify that we have our WHO colleagues online as well with us. Uh, that is a collective effort, is not one part on another. Now, my, my, um, we had a brief interaction today to, to make sure that there is a clear message coming to the TB programs uh, uh, and partners involved in the TB response in the countries. The C19RM uh, in, uh, opportunity that is presented here today, uh, you need to make sure that whatever you hear, whatever you are told, whatever gossip, whatever somebody from a country team comes to you, you need to uh, know that it has the, this funding is available for three opportunities. One is to fight COVID. The other is to mitigate the effect that COVID has on the three diseases. And the other is related to strengthening the systems for health and communities in the countries. Tuberculosis, it comes across these three areas and it fits very well in each of these areas. So uh, irrespective of people telling you, no, this is just COVID, you should not accept this. You will hear this from Eliwood. You will hear this from Mark Eddington. You will hear it from everyone. It is very clear spelled out in the documentation. Very clearly, TB fits into the how to fight COVID. There will be procurements there. And procurements there that at least at minimum, you need to ensure that for TB, you secure in their protective equipment, masks, go for N95 masks, don't accept that this is going just for one disease like COVID. TB is an airborne disease. We fight for protective equipment for a long time. Infection control equipment, all that package that you will hear about and you, we know all about it, ensure that uh, that is present as well. Ensure that diagnostics, as you know very well, there are machines these days for molecular, rapid molecular tests, as well as for X-ray that apply for TB and COVID in the same time. Please make sure that these are part of the COVID baseline. 
and please make sure that is there captured in the list of requests that are coming and are going to the CCMs. For the mitigation part, and you will hear in detail from everybody here, there are a, a bucket of interventions related to bidirectional testing, contact investigation, as well as uh, engagement of communities and civil society, as well as, very important, addressing stigma. The addressing stigma can be also part of the core piece related to the COVID. The last piece, the last bucket that uh, C19RM is asking for is related very much to the strengthening systems and communities, and then here constructing communities that can fight TB and COVID in the same time, being two airborne diseases with similar symptoms and similar um, uh, way of diagnosing and dealing with it, is something that we should have captured in the proposal. I'm sorry I'm entering into this, but we discussed this morning with our colleagues, uh, and uh, uh, especially from the Global Fund, and we want to make this very clear. And please, the reason, the way of getting, um, the way of getting these pieces into the applications is by you being engaged in the process for the C19RM application. In many instances, as NTP managers, you might not be aware, invited, engaged for whatever reason. We, are, we will not have time to deal with the reason now. But what we must have time to deal with, and I offer my personal support, the one of Stop TB, and I imagine my colleagues from USAID and Global Fund will say the same, as we are all in the boat, if you are not allowed to engage in this process at country level, if you are not invited, please let us know, because that should not happen. The last thing I want to make, we are under pressure with the time. Today, Global Fund launched, uh, Global Fund put a press release in which they speak about the impact in Asia and Africa of COVID. And TB is heavily affected, is the highest, as you can see, 60% uh, impact on people getting uh, access to diagnosis and treatment, 60%, by far the highest. So we don't have, we should not accept not to be part of these discussions and we should not accept that the TB angles, as, as I just mentioned to you and you will hear today, are not part of this application. With this, I stop here uh, because uh, time is very short and I apologize for taking longer, but uh, we, sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Rochika. So next uh, we have uh, Sherry Vincent, who heads the TB part in the US state. Uh, so, uh, Ricarda, can you please uh, play the video? Yeah. Um, so, good morning, um, good afternoon, good evening. Um, I first want to, to say thank you to all of you, not just for participating in this webinar, but um, for all the work that you've done over the past year facing COVID. I know it's been very difficult. And as I say, the TB programs are the unsung heroes of, of the COVID response. Many of you were asked to, to respond and to work on COVID or the inner relationship between TB and COVID. And we know that a lot of the efforts has been due to, to your work. And I know this is another, um, another request, another um, urgent action that needs to be taken, but I think this is a really great opportunity. It's, it's potentially the financing that we've said we've never had since, you know, TB has only gotten 18% of the Global Fund resources, and there's a potential for, for TB to get more. Um, the U.S. government's contribution, the $3.5 billion that is the majority of this, um, is part of a larger American response plan. Um, that was passed by Congress um, that is almost $12 billion. It includes a vaccine component, which this is not part of it. So um, that, that's going through Gavi, but also USAID will have significant resources as well as some other agencies will have some, but the bulk of the resources will come through USAID. And so it's really important um, as my first point that you coordinate um, with our, our um, USAID colleagues on the ground because this will be able to be like linked up and coordinated with other activities that will be coming down the pike as that money starts to be released um, uh, shortly. So there, it is part of a whole big package. On the Global Fund, um, as, as Luchika has mentioned, you know, TB was 
affected more than the other diseases. That's the facts. We have the data. That's the evidence. Um, the overlap between the two diseases as well, facts, evidence, um, you know, their respiratory pathogens, um, airborne diseases, the interventions are, are similar. Um, and if we are to prevent the next pandemic, we have to build on that platform. So if we're going to use these resources efficiently, we have to build on that platform. So I think when you're talking to your Minister of Health, I think when you're discussing with um, your colleagues in the CCM in country, that these are points that are really important to bring forward because it's not putting TB or TB patients first because it's the whole community. We are treating the community. Um, it's, it's making the best use of these resources, building on the knowledge and expertise that your programs have. So I think whatever we can do to help that, um, there will be need, need to be a focus. It's not, you can't do everything. So I think also figuring out what are your top priorities, what are you going to focus on, and really um, prioritizing those to make sure that there's adequate funding for that. And I think that's part of this webinar to help with the focusing of what really are these things that we can get, as we say, the best bang for the buck. Um, and, and that's really what we want to focus so that we can actually MTB. This is a great opportunity. These resources are, are um, tremendous and whatever we can do to take advantage of this um, to help TB patients. And then the last thing is communities. Communities are extremely important, as you all know. I think it's important um, to work together. We're stronger together. Um, we all have our comparative advantages, you know, as the government. I understand the role of the government to lead, but we cannot leave our communities behind. We can't leave civil society behind. We're stronger with them, and the better we partnership with them in proposals, the better that um, we'll have success. So thank you very much. I appreciate your time, um, and I look forward to the presentations and discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. Uh, uh, now we have um, uh, Mark Keddington, who heads the Grant Management Division of uh, Global Fund. Ricardo, if you can play the video, please. So C19 RM is, is, is really critical. Um, as you're aware, um, the US um, kindly gave us uh, $3.5 billion um, for the fight against COVID. Um, we also have an additional uh, 140,000 euros from Germany. Um, we expect um, a few more donations. And so we, we, we're thinking that we probably have about 4 billion uh, eventually this time around. The allocation letters went out to countries last week. Um, there's still a couple trickling out, um, but we did get about 110, 115 out, out last week. Um, that allocation that goes out is the, what we call in the base allocation, which is 15% um, of a country's current HIV, TB uh, and malaria allocation. And then there's the opportunity for um, at least another 15% for countries that need it. I mean, we, you know, we, we talk sometimes about the um, Lesotho Egypt scale. So if it's a country like Egypt, which gets a relatively small allocation from the Global Fund because it has a relatively small disease burden, but has a large population, we would expect them to get more in terms uh, of, of uh, above the 15% base allocation because they'll obviously need it in terms of COVID. If you have a country like Lesotho, which has a pretty small population, but a very high HIV burden, therefore has a relatively high HIV, TB uh, and malaria burden, we would expect them not to get that much more above the 15% base. So just wanted people to be aware of that. Um, the immediate push on C19RM for us is on the, uh, the fast track ordering of commodities. Um, we're aware it's been three or four months since we uh, had funds to approve and therefore there are a number of countries that will have urgent commodity needs. Uh, in COVID, so particularly PPE, diagnostics, potentially oxygen at this point. Um, and so that's that's the immediate push. Um, 
I think in terms of, of how we want to do this, uh, our board's been very clear that the engagement of CCMs, PRs, as well as the national response coordinator um, for COVID is going to be absolutely critical. We also want to see increased civil society and community participation uh, and involvement. Um, and again, our board has been uh, very clear on that. Um, if there are any questions, please, um, and, and you're helping countries do this, please just ask them to reach out to, uh, to their country teams. Um, I think stepping back, um, what I think would be would be great from the TB community is I think the TB community, in, in the same way to some extent as the HIV and the malaria um, community, has sometimes seen this as a either or scenario. Um, either the money goes to COVID or it goes to TB, to TB. Either it goes to COVID or it goes to HIV. Um, and I'd encourage us to take a, a different view of that. Um, right now, COVID is the greatest threat to the Global Fund's mission. Um, and, and we sort of have to deal with, to with COVID as, at the same time as we're dealing with TB, HIV and malaria. Um, so I would say, don't, you know, try not to fight uh, COVID and, and resources going to COVID. I would focus on where programs for COVID and TB can mutually reinforce each other. Um, and I think there's some huge gains to be had there, particularly for TB. And you know, as I said, we just had a couple of slides on bidirectional testing, which is a which is a great example, I think, as as to where both COVID and TB can 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 help reinforce each other, um, particularly with a focus on increasing access for testing. We know that in in most countries, for example, in Africa, that there simply isn't enough testing to to really even understand the scale of the COVID epidemic. Um, and I know that's also the same in some countries um, for for TB. So I think that the um, the the focus of of the 3.5 billion, as it is currently, a little bit more, um, we do expect a, a significant amount of that um, to go on procurement. So PPE, um, uh, diagnostic tests, uh, oxygen, um, therapeutics, such as there are effective therapeutics for COVID, and, and, and sadly there aren't there aren't that many right now. Um, I think PPE could could cover sort of N95 FFP2 masks for for, for TB as well. Um, it could also cover um, diagnostics, um, diagnostic machines, gene expert, etc. Um, for TB and COVID, uh, as well as x-ray machines, infection control equipment. A lot of those are sort of dual use. I think anything that is dual use is, is, is makes a very strong case. I do think it's important looking at the issue of increasing access to testing, that we make sure that we don't just um, buy equipment for capital cities and, and, and big cities, but, but we actually think about how we're gonna e increase access uh, out in remoter areas as well, which might mean um, smaller capacity uh, equipment. Um, I think also there's a great need to prioritize as these uh, C19RM requests have, have been put together, um, not putting everything in, but, but really just sort of prioritizing. Uh, and, and, you know, that includes um, community health workers and civil society. I think, you know, our board's made it pretty clear. They expect to see um, more community interventions, more civil society interventions. Um, and I think we, we really need to think about where those can add value, um, whether it's uh, active case finding, whether it's um, community-led monitoring, um, whether it's, um, you know, what, what, whatever it happens to be, because I think we will be looking quite hard um, to fund uh, strong approaches in, in, in those areas. Um, and of course, also contact investigation, active case finding, treatment support and follow up. All of those are places where community groups and civil society can be, can be very, very effective. Um, I think as sort of we at the Global Fund look at, look at this year, at least uh, in, in, in grant management and the country teams, it's very much about three things. It's about catch up from last year, because we know that, you know, particularly in TB, a lot of the targets were not there. Scale up, um, because the new grants are already on average about 20% more um, than, than they were in the last cycle. And then of course, C19RM. And so when you, when you look at all of that, I think that the focus from the TB community shouldn't just be about looking at C19RM as a potential source of money, but looking at how 
together we're going to do this 20% scale up in the current grants, which is already a stretch. How we're going to together do the, the catch up on targets, as well as how we're going to do these mutually reinforcing things out of C19RM um, that where, where we can really help address both TB and COVID. But I wouldn't want to see all the attention of the TB community diverted to kind of how can we get more money out of C19RM at the expense of the catch up and the scale up. Um, in in the current grants, um, that's obviously a personal opinion. I mean, you guys can at the end of the day, you'll, you you will do what you want. Um, I think in terms of if I had an ask for all of you, um, it would be to to focus on on speed here. Um, we see COVID uh, and C nineteen RM as an emergency program primarily, which means that you know we know that not all the data is going to be there. We know that there isn't time to take three to six months to put in a, a put in an application or a funding request this has to be done quickly so like i say the focus is on those um immediate commodity needs and then the first windows for uh funding request um submissions start in in mid-may which is not a lot of time um but we really do think if this is treated as an emergency that is enough time um to get some some good requests in um we'd like to see uh robust requests as as, re as robust as they can be um, strong collaboration at the country level. Um, obviously, that includes civil society communities as well as the COVID National Response Coordinator. And you know, the thing about COVID is it, it's, it's a little different in every country. In some countries, it's firmly within the Ministry of Health. In others, it's been pulled into the presidency. Um, you know, it's in different places. And so figuring out how we keep everybody informed um, is going to be really critical, as well as with, um, you know, bilaterals, uh, for example, such as such as the US government, which is also putting some significant amounts of its own money into COVID, as well as giving money with us. So we need to make sure that coordination is there, because we don't want to see duplication, um, and we also don't want to see unnecessary gaps um, that could be filled, um, as well as the, the adversary and communication, which we all know is critical. Um, I think we're all wary of COVID, we're all wary of masks, we're all wary of social distancing, but, you know, we've, we've, we've got to get there. And it, and it can be easy at times for those of us who are living in countries um, or who might be living in countries um, where, you know, the vaccine rollout is going well and cases are going down. But, you know, I can tell you, even in Switzerland, that's not the case. <laughs> and it certainly isn't the case in most of the countries. Um, um, where the global fund is investing. It's it's a different view if you're looking at it from, from Africa than if you're looking at it from, from, from another country where all of those vaccine rollouts are are going well. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna stop there. Um, just to say, you know, I I think honestly believe we have no choice um, but to to continue in the fight against COVID. We will never achieve the mission um, of the global fund and the three diseases. Uh, and we certainly will not be able to get back on track in order to meet the 2030 targets. Um, and I know all of you are extremely focused on that in terms of TB. Thank you, Mark. Uh, some important messages there from the Global Fund. Uh, we uh, now have uh, Eliwood Vandwalo, uh, who heads the TB advisors team in Global Fund. Uh, Eliwood, uh, please go ahead. Thank you, sir. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, colleagues. I'll be very quickly. I think um, uh, a lot of uh, you know things have already been said uh, by the previous speakers. So what I would like to emphasize is just two things. First, I think it's critical for the NTP managers and TB stakeholders to be involved in the C19 RIM uh, county dialogue as well as funding request. Uh, it's critical because, as Rushika highlighted, the objective of this funding is on the three areas, of course, to respond to the COVID epidemic, mitigate the impact of COVID on tuberculosis, HIV, and malaria, and also to support a critical health and community system to respond to the epidemic. So you could see TB is cross-cutting across all the three priority areas. And of course, the most important part is to mitigate the impact of COVID on tuberculosis. TB has been disproportionately affected by COVID. Uh, and we know that TB is a major contributor and a beneficiary of the health and community system. Uh, you need to prioritize uh, interventions which are due purpose uh, and uh, investment which uh, you know, will support both COVID 
uh, and tuberculosis. So when there's a discussion about PPE, you have to ensure that TB workers and health workers, uh, they will also be benefiting uh, from, from, from the PPE. The same applies to diagnostic, infection control, contact investigation, and of course, stigma. Uh, which also um, relate to tuberculosis and both COVID. So it's important uh, to be involved uh, in this process uh, at your country level. So two things to emphasize, uh, in order for you to present a robust case uh, for, for, for COVID, you need to do uh, an analysis of the impact of the COVID uh, at your country and also at sub-national level. Uh, this will give you a very compelling case. Uh, I think countries need to be very ambitious, and you will hear from our colleagues uh, that there is above allocation for this one, uh, and you can go even above 30% uh, overall uh, uh, request. Uh, I think see whether the intervention could be funded through the grant. Uh, if the grant doesn't have space uh, for additional activity, ensure that these activities are also included in C19. Uh, a number of countries have costed uh, catch up plants, restorative plants, uh, use these plants uh, to build a strong case uh, during the country dialogue for C19 and ensure that these plants are funded uh, either in the grant or if not enough funding in the grants uh, to ensure that they are included in the C19. Of course, as you put uh, interventions which could be used for the COVID as well as TB, uh, there will be need of additional uh, reagents, commodity, et cetera, uh, ensure those are well uh, budgeted. Uh, first in the grant, of course, because we have a, a lot of funding in the grant at the moment. Uh, and if it's not be able to fund it through the grant, uh, ensure that they are included and in the C19 RIM uh, funding request. Uh, reach out to our county team if you have any question uh, on, on uh, how TB could be included or also to, to our partners. And I'm sure Stop TB will give you a link where you can reach out if you have more questions about this. There are a lot of full documents and material in our website, and we'll be putting the links to those websites as we will be going ahead with this workshop. So I'll stop there and back to yourself. Thank you, Eliud. Uh, now we go into uh, how do countries apply for this opportunity? And we have, uh, Ketevan from um, Global Fund, the C19 RM Secretariat, uh, to tell us about it. Uh, of course, there are a lot of things there. There is a website devoted to it, a lot of documents. So uh, I, we have requested Ketevan to just give you a brief uh, key highlights of that. Uh, and if you have questions, you can type them simultaneously on the chat. Thank you. Uh, uh, Ketevan, please go ahead. We can see Thank you. Thank you, Sahu. Thank you. Thank you, and, and good day, um, everyone. Um, I will spend a few a few minutes uh, focusing on the areas that were not covered by the previous presenters, more on the operational side of um, C19 RM. I, I do want to highlight uh, and re-emphasize re that the, the reason why we're able to um, to um, uh, launch the, the next phase of C19 RM is um, is um, thanks to the to the U.S. government's contribution of 3.5 billion um, uh, dollars, and then um, afterward, Germany also announced the contribution of 140 million euros. So um, this made it possible to to launch the next phase of um, of C19 RM. Uh, what we are doing is that. Uh, we are building on lessons learned from the previous phase um, of C19 RM, as you know, was implemented in, in 2020, um, and we've we've um, taken um, a stock of of lessons from the from the phase and enhanced the mechanism to respond um, to um, to the needs um, in the countries. I will focus um, um, on on a few points, which I and I already saw um, a few questions in the chat. Um, so uh, the the main question I, I think I'm sure everybody is asking who is eligible to receive um, C19 RM funds, um, and it is all current implementer countries, including regional uh, regional and multi country recipients that are receiving funding from the global fund currently um, can apply for C19 RM funding, um, and every uh, eligible um, applicant um, has received um, the allocation letters. We have only uh, three um, outstanding allocation letters that will be sent out 
um, this week. Um, other than that, um, all the um, eligible countries and multi-countries have already received the allocation letters. Um, what is um, eligible? So the, the eligible investments, um, Elliot already mentioned, are structured around three broad categories. Um, uh, one is on the first one is on the COVID-19 response, specifically on diagnostics, PPA, uh, therapeutics, um, the COVID-19 related adaptation of programs to fight TB, HIV, TB, and malaria, and this is specifically um, focused on on the mitigation of um, of impact, which will be uh, critically important. Uh, and, la and lastly, the third one is on the strengthening of health and community systems. Uh, and we do want to, um, I, I would like to strengthen the, um, the, the point that uh, cross-cutting uh, community responses is something that we, we hope to see uh, more of um, in this phase of C19RM. Uh, we are encouraging applicants to think um, about including oxygen support in their applications. We saw that there was a, um, a not sufficient attention paid to it uh, in the last phase. Um, however, um, given the significance of um, oxygen, oxygen support in treating severe um, cases, uh, we, we hope to see more of, um, uh, of that activity um, in the application materials. We are not going to be supporting direct um, procurement of uh, vaccines, nor be the primary, um, uh, primarily focused on vaccine delivery and deployment. Um, the, the, so I mentioned to you the um, the base uh, the uh, the allocation letter. So the allocation letter um, gives um, a, an important um, number, which we call the base um, allocation, which is equivalent to fifteen percent of the country's HIV TB malaria allocation amount of 2020-2022. As though, so the countries, uh, every applicant that receives um, uh, the allocation letter will know exactly what that uh, base allocation is. Um, and more or less uh, every applicant should um, expect to receive this um, uh, base allocation, obviously subject to the submission of the, of the robust request and the review and approval of the funding, but this is more or less what the country should expect to receive. In addition to that, in the allocation letter, there is a second important um, uh, uh, number, which is what we call the above base allocation. So every applicant is encouraged to submit ambitious above a base allocation request. As an indicative amount, we said at least 15% on top of the base allocation. Uh, and, and applicants can come even with more than 15% of above base allocation. It's important to understand that the, at the time of making um, the, the award decisions, um, the Global Fund will be looking at the above base allocation requests and, and making adjustments. And some countries, as M Mark mentioned, this Egypt Lesotho um, uh, scale, um, as some countries, if they are more on the Egypt side of, um, of the scale, may receive, in addition to their base allocation, a portion of their above base allocation as immediate award. Um, while some countries may receive only 15%, um, and the remaining, whatever is a quality demand will be registered as the unfunded demand. Um, and since we, do, we still expect to receive um, additional donor funding, uh, this, the, the unfunded demand uh, will be the first um, point for us to look into if we, if for instance, we have more donor funding coming through, um, through C19RM, we will be topping up um, a grants um, based on the, on the register of unfunded demand. So it's, it's very, very important that countries appreciate the importance of this above base allocation requests. What is um, also very, very critical is um, what you will see, um, uh, you, you will probably hear a lot of is this fast track uh, application. Um, so in the allocation letter, the applicants will uh, have been informed that they can submit the, uh, their fast track applications um, as soon as they are ready. And the idea of the fast track application is to ensure that the countries um, are able to place orders for urgent health products, like the PPE, the, uh, the COVID diagnostics, and therapeutics, and specifically I'd, I'll outline the oxygen support. Um, and, and activities for, uh, for um, effective deployment of such uh, health products. So um, since we know many countries are at this point running out of this um, health products, we want to ensure that the countries can place orders quickly, um, also with the understanding that there is a lag between when the orders are placed and when the, uh, the, the health products are delivered actually in the country. So we want to, to allow the countries to express this 
um, through the fast track application. The fast track funding request is section one of the of the funding request form, and um, they can be submitted on the rolling basis. So as soon as the country is, is ready, they can be, they can send it to us, um, and the review will be done on a on an expedited um, uh, a timeline. Um, uh, so that um, decisions can be made uh, quite quickly uh, on the fast track funding requests. And this is basically taking a portion of their base allocation um, and coming with the, uh, with an urgent needs um, before, while they take more time to develop other interventions, uh, which um, the countries can submit through the, what we call the full funding request. And for the full funding request, um, I do want to um, show you this, um, the submission window timelines. Um, I, I think this is important to, to keep in mind. As Mark said, since this is an emergency response, we do um, want to, um, uh, to, to say that the countries should be coming with the request quite quickly. Um, and the first full submission window is on the 14th of May. Um, next one is in two weeks time, end of May. Um, the third one will be mid-June and end of June. So currently we anticipate to have four submission windows, um, the last one being on the 30th of June. And the, in the allocation letter, we have asked the applicants to register for the respective windows within two weeks of receiving the allocation letter. So this will, will allow us to have um, a good visibility of uh, which um, countries are, are going to submit their applications in which window. Um, and um, after the at the last window, we will be reassessing the uh, the situation and looking at what is uh, remain what remains to be um, awarded um, at that time. The uh, the timelines uh, also uh, one point to to note here is that the use of funds for C nineteen R M has been extended to thirty um, first of December twenty twenty three. However, since this is an emergency response, we do expect the funds to be utilized um, well before um, this deadline. Um, uh, lastly, um, I'll mention on the implementation arrangements. So, as I said. All eligible countries um, and multi-countries can receive funding. What is critical also to note is that um, the funding should be channeled through existing um, implementation arrangements. So uh, we would expect it to be channeled through existing grants, principal recipients. Again, so this is an emergency response. There is no time to set up new um, new implementation arrangements. In some instances, there may be a justification to have a new sub-recipient. Um, however, the new principal recipients should be something very, very exceptional, um, and, and in a way it will uh, almost defeat the purpose of the emergency response. As um, you know, with new principal recipients, um, there's usually a long process of um, uh, first selection of the principal recipients and then um, doing the capacity assessment and um, setting up the systems in place, so uh, we, we don't expect to see requests for new principal recipients. Um, and lastly, I will um, flag uh, one point on the community engagement. Um, the requests have to be submitted by the CCMs. They have to have the full CCM endorsement. Um, we also expect um, a, a meaningful and inclusive decision-making and consultation with stakeholders um, to the extent that it is possible um, in, the, in the emergency context of the, of the countries. Um, we also want to reinforce the importance of community and civil society engagement um, in this um, conversations, and we are hoping to see more of the community-led um, interventions to be uh, coming through the funding requests, which unfortunately was not the case in the, uh, in the previous phase of implementation. Um, I'll stress again uh, the point that Mark made um, about the involvement of the COVID-19 national response coordinating bodies. Um, it's, it's absolutely critical because the, the support that we provide through C19RM should be um, complementary and should be within the parameters established um, by, the, by the national uh, response. Um, and um, any COVID-19 control and containment interventions have to be endorsed by the COVID-19 national response body entity, whatever form it is in, in a respective country. So all fast track applications have to be endorsed. Um, by the COVID-19 national response uh, coordinating entity. Um, I will, I think I will stop here, Saho, and then see if there are any questions that I can, I can answer. 
Thank you, Kato. Thank you for uh, uh, you know putting a lot of things together in a short and con concise manner. Uh, Daisy has put in the chat a link uh, for uh, all the documents there for the C19. We encourage participants to go to the website and have a look after the webinar. Uh, there are some questions on the chat. Maybe if Ketavan, if you can respond to that. And meanwhile, we will continue. The next is a series of uh, presentations on the TB technical areas. Specifically, we have chosen to focus a bit more on some, some areas like bidirectional testing, contact investigation, as well as uh, uh, community intervention. There was a chat question there. So all, all those will be discussed. And at the end, we will also have a presentation on how to access the TA available for developing C19 RM proposals from the TB perspective. So first of all, uh, I will uh, uh, present to you uh, what TB and COVID interventions uh, could be considered. So uh, I think you can see my screen here. Um, yes, so, um, so uh, uh, we, we, uh, you all may have uh, noticed that uh, uh, in, in March, we put out in, a, in the media in a very strong way, uh, the data that was quite compelling, the, the impact that COVID had on TB. Uh, we put it as uh, 12 months of uh, COVID-19 eliminated 12 years of progress. Uh, and this is uh, quite a quite a unprecedented kind of impact uh, that TB responses have had in countries. By the way, most of the impact has been in, uh, I mean, the, 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 the Asian countries have uh, had a bigger impact than other parts of the world uh, on their TB programs. We also learned during this period that uh, if people are co-infected with TB and COVID, data emerging from India and South Africa showing that the mortality could be three times uh, higher. Uh, at the same time, WHO also put out, uh, based on the data collected uh, from countries for 2020, uh, um, uh, this figure that 1.4 million fewer TB notified in 2020 compared to 2019. And also this uh, 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 figure that uh, in 2020 itself additional, there could be half a million TB deaths uh, additional to 1.4 million that was estimated earlier. And you can see the graph there, how the case detection was increasing in countries, but is now has now plummeted down. So that's a huge uh, impact. Now, while this was all happening, if you look at the data of uh, people dying due to COVID and TB in Africa and Asia, where most of the TB high burden countries, global fund eligible countries are there, we put together the data from WHO from 1st March to uh, 10th uh, April this year. Uh, it appears that uh, TB has uh, taken the lives of many more people than COVID. Of course, both are important. So it is very important that uh, we address both of them. Now, coming to what can be done uh, for this, as you heard, uh, uh, th there are three objectives. So you can see on the slide uh, bottom part, we will circulate the slides to you. Uh, it is also in the document, the information note. There are three objectives there. There are also three information notes that are important. The first one is uh, the COVID-19 response uh, uh, mechanism, the information note on it which is on the first objective. The second objective is about mitigating the impact of TB, uh, uh, impact of COVID on TB, HIV and malaria. So that also has an information note. Uh, and then there is a third part, which is uh, on the community uh, uh, systems and responses, uh, which is uh, till yesterday was not on the website, but uh, I'm told it will be soon on the website as well. So th these are three which are kind of guiding documents that we encourage people to look at. The information note uh, number two, the mitigation of COVID impact on TB was uh, done through a process, uh, uh, done rapidly, but through a lot of uh, experience compiled from countries and consultations. So that is something that, uh, that is available for you all to look at. And I will briefly touch upon a few important things from uh, the information note. So first to note, is that in the first objective, the first information note on C19RM, uh, it is uh, organized into pillars. And these pillars are the WHO recommendations for plans for countries uh, for addressing COVID-19. 
there are 10 pillars currently. And as Ketavan pointed out, vaccine is not a focus for global funds. So here you see nine pillars uh, enlisted there. The ninth one is very clear, and that is the one which is uh, how to mitigate the impact of COVID on other diseases. Here in this context is TB, HIV, malaria. The other eight pillars also is something that TB responses and proposals can connect in this proposal. I think Ruchika was clear on it, Mark was clear on it. Uh, some of the examples here, pillar three, if you see, includes contact tracing, right? It's airborne disease, COVID and TB. So there are some commonality here, TB uh, contact tracing and investigation. And we will come to this in more detail in another presentation, how to do that in a, uh, in a way that could benefit both the response for TB as well as uh, COVID. Uh, pillar five is lab and diagnostics, very important for TB uh, about this bi-directional testing and multi-disease testing platforms. And we will discuss this in another subsequent presentation. We also have uh, in pillar six, airborne uh, infection uh, prevention and control. That's again, something that uh, TB and COVID can both uh, benefit. Now, shifting to the second information note, there are uh, many things there I would like to highlight uh, in diagnosis part, you will see there bi-directional testing. We will have more details in a presentation and there is also a link there where we have additional document, which we will hear soon. Uh, which gives you more details on it. Then the diagnostics part, uh, including X-ray with computer-aided detection, rapid molecular tests, sample transportation. Uh, then the contact tracing part, also a document, additional document that you will find with a link there, uh, and we will have a presentation on it. And many countries have done campaigns uh, with active and intensified case finding, and depending on the setting, that is also important. There are several. Uh, things there which have been given for treatment for the lack of time. I will not go into the details of it, but you can see in the slide and, for, uh, and we will make the slides uh, available to you. The prevention part, very important to note, uh, the airborne infection prevention and control, uh, the IPC part, PPE, as well as many other things that can be done, that TB programs have the expertise and there was always a plan to do that, but maybe uh, we have not progressed fast enough. This will benefit both TB and COVID and also prepare us for any future airborne uh, pandemics. Um, uh, TB programs have to adapt to the COVID situation. We see uh, waves coming, even now some of the countries are affected with even bigger waves of uh, COVID infection there. So the model needs to shift to a community home-based and people-centered model. There are several other recommendations in the uh, in the information note. I've, I will not go through uh, all of them. It is listed here. Very important also to highlight the part which is stigma, which was also mentioned in the opening. Stigma, discrimination, and fear. We need to do something about it. And also important to note the uh, real-time data and how valuable it can be in this time of COVID pandemic to adjust and adapt the TB uh, response to it. And just an uh, example how India uh, participants are there from India as well. The uh, publicly available real-time uh, data uh, showed in India the decline in notification immediately following the lockdown and how it helped the country to, to start a response uh, for recovery. Now, just to conclude, this is a great opportunity for TB programs to recover, but we need to be strategic. We cannot just put everything that we put in a normal TB proposal there. So TB has been disproportionately affected by COVID. But TB also has most in common, uh, if you look at the COVID and TB, COVID and other disease responses. So how can we propose something which is strategic and prioritize uh, uh, the intervention? So that, was, that is going to be very important. It, it is very important to have a high ambition level. It is better to ask and be told the money cannot be given than to remain quiet. And, uh, and, and see the dramatic impact that TB is having from the COVID pandemic. So thank you all. Uh, I will stop sharing my screen so that we can go to the next presentation and we'll do a series now, uh, one after the other. The next one is on bi-directional uh, testing or also called as integrated or simultaneous testing of TB and COVID. We will have it in three parts. Uh, uh, and we will have Amy Piatek from USAID uh, with the first part. Uh, then Wayne from Stop TB will come in with uh, the second part, which will focus more on the diagnostics and multiplexing. 
And the third part will be from Srinivas from Stop TB on uh, how this can be done and the experience in India. So, uh, Ricardo, if you can play the video from Amy. Um, so thanks again, everyone, for joining this um, this call this morning for me, this afternoon or evening. So as Sahu had suggested or had said, um, we're going to now present the diagnostics piece, which you know all of the presenters thus far have said is a very important and prioritized component of, of this, um, this funding. Um, the diagnostics piece and the combined testing for COVID-19 and TB is one of the prioritized interventions that we think will um, play a critical role in restoring and accelerating the TB services. So um, I don't want to repeat what uh, Sahu had said. I just wanted to highlight a couple of things. So we're talking here about what we're calling simultaneous and integrated, also being known as bi-directional approach to testing for both COVID-19 and TB. So a simultaneous integrated or the bi-directional approach to testing for COVID-19 and TB should be implemented in countries with a high burden of TB. While we know that there are clearly other pathogens that have similar respiratory symptoms, the approach is focused on COVID-19 and TB for several reasons, and I'm just going to highlight a few here. The first is that COVID-19 and TB are respiratory diseases that manifest themselves with similar symptoms of cough, fever, and difficulty breathing. Um, the, the, the key piece here for diagnostics is that currently multiplex or platforms that can test for different diseases, uh, they do exist. Um, and we are currently using them you know, for the tuberculosis program and other diseases. And they can test for both mycobacterium tuberculosis and COVID-19. Um, you know, right now we have um, a significant network of these um, instruments such as the gene expert. Um, that are already available in, in all of our high burden TB countries. And then, you know, lastly, both diseases require early detection and treatment to improve patient outcomes and to most importantly, you know, reduce transmission among contacts and within communities. So as um, Sahu has already laid out and, and others before him, um, you know, the, the C19 are on technical information note and I really highly stress to please look at this. Um, there's a lot of really good information, a lot of good references, and there's a lot of information there on the diagnostics piece. Um, and what also I wanted to highlight specifically when we're talking about diagnostics and the simultaneous integrated testing approach is the USAID and the stop to be partnership did develop guidance for the simultaneous integrated testing for COVID-19 and TB disease for high burden countries that is referenced in the, C um, the C19RM information note. Um, so again, um, you know, we're just highlighting here some of the, um, the broader pieces of this, um, but again, please take the time to download this um, and, and look at it carefully. Um, it's really important to notice that this guidance, like I said, is, is general and it must be adapted for use in line with the policies and guidelines of the specific national TB programs in our countries and the COVID-19 response. So um, I'm gonna just very briefly in a couple of slides describe the, the diagnostic testing approaches that are within this guide. And like Sahu said, you know, my colleagues Wayne and um, Srinivas will follow. You know, Wayne will describe the diagnostic tests available um, and other options and considerations. And then Srinivas will describe India's, India's experience with the bi-directional testing. Um, so here, you know, there are a few diagnostic testing approaches countries can employ to test for both COVID-19 and TB. And the first that I'm going to describe um, in general is what we're calling, like I said, the simultaneous integrated or bi-directional testing. So this schematic is in the guidance. Um, so we're gonna go through it very quickly here, but you'll be able to look at it in more detail. Um, the, the simultaneous integrated testing for COVID-19 and TB. So what, how this starts is we really want this to start with um, when a person presents to a healthcare facility or provider with respiratory symptoms, including cough and difficulty breathing, for example. Um, at that point, um, the diagnostic test for both COVID-19 and TB should be done at the same time. So we are advocating that um, we are co you collect a specimen for COVID testing and you collect a specimen for TB testing at the same time. 
That is where the simultaneous piece comes from. Um, we would also want to emphasize that this should really be done at the peripheral level. This, the testing should be done in facilities um, and with platforms that are as close to the person and the communities as possible. Um, we know that this has been something that we've really focused on for TB. Um, and we know that this is something also that has been seen as incredibly important for COVID, um, you know, because of the fact that there are these lockdowns and, and people are unable and specimens are unable to really move around the country. Um, so uh, we um, advocate that, you know, once you have these specimens, um, they are transferred to a diagnostic center that does have a multiplex platform. That's where the integrated piece comes from. There you would run the test for TB and COVID, returning the results um, to providers and initiating appropriate treatment. We understand that, you know, there are situations where the multiplex testing will not be available. Um, when that's the case, you should still collect both specimens and they should be referred for testing for both diseases according to the national diagnostic algorithms. Again, preferably at peripheral or decentralized locations so that we can increase accessibility and hopefully timeliness. And like I said before, the reporting of the results to both disease programs is absolutely critical. Simultaneous integrated testing is especially important for people who are at elevated risk of having one or both diseases or who are um, vulnerable to unfavorable outcomes, including older populations, people with comorbidities like diabetes and COPD. And countries can also expand the symptoms um, that are relevant for, for countries, but they can also include people who meet the definition of having severe acute respiratory infection or influenza-like illness. There are also um, situations that would require us to test for COVID-19 and or TB. Um, now, while we really are advocating that countries prioritize the simultaneous integrated testing for COVID-19 and TB, we realize that there are situations where testing for one disease or the other should occur. And here we have um, some examples. So the first would be in testing for COVID-19 or TB comorbidity in people that are diagnosed with the other disease. So, um, you know, since most countries are not currently carrying out simultaneous testing for both diseases, usually resulting in testing and diagnosis of either COVID-19 or TB. So as we've said before, you know, given the poor prognosis of people with TB and COVID-19 co-infections, we really should be striving to test people diagnosed with COVID-19 for TB and to test people that have already been diagnosed with TB or COVID-19. And just to highlight that treatment of TB should always continue and uninterrupted, even if the person is also diagnosed for COVID-19. There's also the situation um, for when we would want to test for COVID-19 or TB in people that have tested negative for the other disease. So persons with respiratory symptoms that previously had tested negative for COVID-19 and not diagnosed as having COVID-19, they should be tested for TB. And people who have respiratory symptoms that previously tested negative for TB and not diagnosed as having TB should be, also, should be tested then for COVID-19. Um, this is my last slide, and this is just showing um, example algorithms that have been adapted from India for some of the situational testing. Um, so diagnosing, so, so situationally testing diagnosed TB patients for COVID and diagnosed COVID-19 patients with TB. Um, there are other examples from some of our other countries that we can also make available for reference, but they pretty much follow these, these general algorithms um, you know, that we have presented here and the ones from India. And like I said before, later Srinivas will give more detail about India's experience. Um, I know that this is, we've gone through this very quickly today, um, but like I said, this, you know, and others have said, this is a real opportunity for our TB programs to not only expand um, the testing for, for TB, the, the rapid testing, um, but to be able to use these platforms to, to kind of cast a wider net for people that have you know, broader respiratory symptoms and hopefully we'll be able to identify not just additional cases of TB, but also um, many more cases of, of COVID-19 in, in communities. So I will stop there um, and now turn it over to my colleague, Wayne, who will provide more information on the specific diagnostic platforms. Thank you. Wayne, please go ahead. 
Great, thank you, Sahu. Let me just share my screen. Okay, so as Amy said, I'll be discussing TB diagnostics in the context of COVID. As, um, as Amy and Sahu and Mark have, have raised, there's a lot of opportunity with this new funding um, to strengthen diagnostic networks, uh, which is really important given the decline seen in many countries um, last year and their notifications. So this presentation is quite technical. I'll be discussing um, the TB diagnostics and the multiplexing platforms. I'm going to go quick, quickly through these slides. Uh, you will have access to them later so that you can refer to the specific information. So when talking about the, the instruments that can be multiplexed for both TB and SARS-CoV-2 MAP testing, it's important to understand firstly the, the Global Fund's quality assurance policy requirements. So the TB diagnostics must be approved by WHO or by the Global Fund's expert review panel for diagnostics. And the SARS-CoV-2 diagnostics must be either on the WHO's emergency use listing or approved pursuant to an emergency procedure set up by um, regulatory authorities in, in these five countries. If you want to see the full list of TB diagnostics, as well as the, uh, the COVID diagnostics eligible for global fund procurement, you can see uh, the links um, at the bottom of this slide. There are essentially five instruments that are of particular interest for multiplexing for TB and COVID. Uh, the five instruments all have TB diagnostics that are recommended by WHO. The first four that are on this list, the Ceph and Gene Experts, Abbott Realtime, Roche Cobis, and BD Max, the COVID tests meet the Global Fund's quality assurance policy for either being on the WHO emerg emergency use list or approved by one of the regulatory authorities. The Mobile TrueNats COVID test, as you can see um, in the bottom row here, its, its test is being reviewed by the WHO for inclusion in the emergency use list. So for countries that are interested in uh, procuring instruments for, for use at near point of care testing, in particular, the Ceph and Gene Experts or the Mobile TrueNats, um, it would make sense when developing the proposals to be generic in the language around the, the NAP tests and platforms um, so that uh, if the mobile true NAT COVID test becomes approved by the WHO on the emergency use list in the coming weeks, then there would be the option of the country to buy uh, mobile true NAT instead of Ceph Gene Expert. So there is a lot of interest now around the true NAT test. This is uh, the battery powered uh, instrumentation. It requires minimal infrastructure requirements. You can even um, put it in a suitcase and transport it. If you're not on the, the Stop TB's mailing list, uh, we sent a news flash last week that uh, Stop TB's GDF has concluded its negotiations with Mobio and there's now this global access pricing uh, for procurement through GDF. So firstly, the instruments, these workstations, uh, there's, there's three options for procurements, either the Uno, Duo, or Quattros. Um, the Duo two-chip port instruments uh, have a very similar uh, daily throughput to the four-module gene expert instruments. So you could do between 15 and 18 tests a day. The price there for that Duo, it was originally negotiated as at $14,000, but uh, GDF has been able to negotiate volume discounts so after 100 instruments are procured, uh, the price will drop to $10,900. And USAID has already committed to buying uh, 100 of these Duo instruments. So that means anyone now wanting to buy these Duo instruments, you pay only $10,900. The price for the tests uh, for either the MTB or the more sensitive MTB plus tests uh, is $9 uh, per test. And for every 100 TB tests that are ordered, you will receive 20 tests for rifampicin resistance uh, at no extra cost. And it's a reflex test. So for anyone who's um, found to have TB from the MTB or MTB plus tests, you should run the rifampicin uh, chip. Uh, GDF has also been able to negotiate comprehensive warranty packages. So they include not only uh, re repair and replacements of parts, but also on-site visits in-country 
of the service provider or, or mobile. Um, we hope this will be a significant improvement over what Cephid is able to offer with their warranty packages. And if you want to learn more about TrueNats, here is a link to an implementation guide that we at stop to be developed uh, with colleagues at USAID uh, and the GLI. There is, of course, a lot of interest also around Gene Expert, particularly with the, the new XDR cartridge, uh, which requires 10 color modules. Now, the Expert's XDR cartridge, uh, of course, should not be budgeted using COVID funds. Um, as you see here, it detects resistance, isonized, fluoroquinolone, second line injectables, and ethionamide. Um, but it's important for budgeting when, when countries are interested in buying new instruments, because if you're interested in, in doing the XDR testing, you will need to have modules in your gene expert that have 10 color optics. The, the existing traditional gene experts have the six color optics. And there are three options to be able to buy these new modules. Either you buy brand new machines. Uh, you see the prices here. They're a couple thousand dollars more expensive than the six color instruments or you can connect them, or it's called a daisy chain, uh, a new instrument to your existing gene expert at a site. Um, you can see the price is a bit lower here. This is because you're not receiving a computer with it. Um, and then the third option is to, to buy new 10 color modules for your existing machines. So you pay $3,860 per module um, and you swap out your, your older modules um, Cephid will not buy those six color modules back. You would be able to put them into your, your national stockpile. And uh, you cannot have hybrid machines. So you cannot have a four color instrument with a couple of the 10 color modules and, and a couple of the six color modules. You have to have all of them converted to, to 10 colors. And also it's important when budgeting, there are uh, requirements for the computer hardwares. So the older gene experts came with computers that run Win XP. You need to buy a new computer that uh, uses Win 10. And uh, if you're using uh, a somewhat older computer that runs Win 7, then Cephid is recommending that you buy the new Windows 10 computers because uh, Microsoft is discontinuing the Windows 7 support this year. And you can see the prices here for the, the desktops and laptops um, available from Cephid through GDF. <clears throat> So for the other three instruments that were on that table that I showed uh, previously, these are called medium complexity NATs by the WHO, medium complexity in terms of infrastructure requirements, um, HR requirements. WHO will be issuing recommendations in a couple months, expected this summer, that we'll be recommending these devices for detection of TB and simultaneously for resistance to rifampicin and isoniazid. These are high throughput instruments. You can see in the table, the uh, first row there uh, shows the, the number of tests that go into batches. And uh, many countries are already using the Abbott Realtime, the M2000 systems, or the Roche COVID systems for um, testing for HIV viral load and for early infant uh, HIV detection. And of course, many of those machines now are being used for, for testing for, for COVID. Um, um, but now since uh, the TB test is becoming recommended as well, you could consider um, uh, buying these platforms for TB testing, uh, multiplexing with the other tests. Uh, but as um, Mark had said in his earlier presentation for countries that are interested in increasing access to remote communities, uh, peripheral settings, uh, these medium complexity NATs um, are not uh, intended for that use. They must be centralized. Just a couple more slides quickly, some considerations uh, for countries when, when thinking about combining testing for COVID and TB. Firstly, when multiplexing with existing testing platforms, the advantages here is that uh, this, this leverages the unused local testing capacity. There's minimal implementation startup costs, um, including around specimen transport, infrastructure requirements. The disadvantages here is that you really need to have site level data on the available testing capacity. If you don't and you take national level averages on utilization rates, you're going to end up um, making mistakes because several, many instruments could be actually be running at full capacity while other ones are being 
not used anywhere near full capacity. Um, <clears throat> there's also a need to uh, prioritize specimens due to uh, the chance of having testing capacity on site exceeded. So you need clear protocols there. Another option is to re relocate testing instruments. But what should really be a key factor is ensuring that patient access to timely TB testing remains. Uh, the advantage is here when you're moving instruments, you might be able to um, uh, increase your usage rates because you're, you're testing more specimens, but the disadvantage potentially is that you're disrupting um, access to, to patient testing, as well as these specimen referral linkages that you had originally designed. Uh, so the third option is around buying new instruments um, and where possible expanding work hours of staff. This is really the preferred solution uh, from a TB's perspective to ensure that there's continued access to rapid testing and minimize impact on existing services. Uh, the disadvantage is that this of course requires more money, um, both for the instrumentation as well as for HR. Uh, and this is where this funding opportunity from, from the Global Fund comes in. Lastly, you should never forget engaging the private sector. They can really play a significant role. So those sites that are able to meet national quality assurance standards uh, should be included when you're mapping the existing instruments in your country and sites in your countries that can be used to test for TB and COVID. Um, and where possible, a country should consider providing free reagents to those cooperating private sector sites. So this was my last slide. I'm now going to hand over to my colleague, Srinivas, who's going to give some real world experience uh, from India. Thank you. Thank you very much. Srinivas, please go ahead. See the slides. Srinivas, we are not seeing your slides yet. If you can, yes. So, Do you see the slides? No, it, it is still a dark screen. Yes, now we can see, but if you can put it in presentation mode and then go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so this is, uh, uh, we have discussed about this bidirectional screening and testing. Um, how it is, and I'm trying to show some of those real life experience from India, where I actually did this in a fairly large scale. And a big acknowledgement to the India and our partners for not only doing this, uh, but also monitoring them and also sharing that for a wider, um, you know, benefit for the world. Uh, as Saho has mentioned earlier, we had seen this, uh, you know, India had this, this sharp decline in the TB notification thanks to their live notification system. And then uh, they developed, um, you know, a recovery plan, a catch up plan very early in uh, the period of uh, this COVID pandemic in 2020. And one of those interventions was this uh, the idea of uh, bi directional screening and testing. And um, the concept was uh, originally very similar, you know, like the TBHIV. Um, you test all the TB people, people with TB diagnosed uh, or on treatment for COVID. And also for COVID patients, you screen them for TB symptoms and then test for them for TB. And we saw some, um, this is uh, early results of a cohort of the patients. India, who had uh, completed uh, who had, uh, um, the data on both the COVID status, COVID positive and COVID negative. And it is very clear from this data that the odds of a person with tuberculosis dying if he has got a COVID as a risk factor is 3.36, or otherwise, is a three times higher risk of uh, ATP patients dying of dying if they have got COVID. This is a very important um, as for the care of a patient, patient with TB. Uh, you need to know the COVID status and we generally both TB and COVID are treated at home with, um, you know, and if we know that their status of COVID, they would require much better attention 
maybe hospitalization and more close follow-up and uh, care to ensure that the lives unnecessarily are not lost. Um, this bi-directional screening, yes, it has been what they do is bi-directional verbal TV screening among all uh, COVID-19 patients with the patients with symptoms of COVID and COVID-19 testing for all diagnosed TB patients. So the question is that is it feasible? In 2020, cumulatively, they were able to know the COVID status of around 24% of the patients and there is a 1.9 percentage of comorbidity. However, in the January, February 2021, till now we have the data, uh, this has increased to around 44 percentage. And as far as the latest information is available, that it has gone to more than 60 percentage um, in the last month. Now, it's, that means that this is feasible and um, of course it needs to be monitored and can be done. So when it comes to this monitoring, we have some data, which again, you now we are always, we, when we are talking about innovations, people again talks about um, what's evidence. Um, and many times evidence and innovation don't go hand in hand. But if we do something massively, do it well, implement it properly and monitor it properly, there can be very useful information coming and which can be uh, replicated in other parts of the world. So here is an example from Kerala. This data is again of 2020. Um, what they were trying to do as a part of the catch up is a number of interventions um, for catching up the lost TB patients during this COVID pandemic. This includes active case finding uh, in vulnerable population, they had a properly done vulnerability mapping of all the population in Kerala, and they identified people vulnerable to TB. So those who are been moderate to high vulnerable, they were mapped and screened and identified percentage TB among them, tested for TB using rapid molecular test and X-ray screening, and the TB diagnosed. Now, there was another group where the active case finding was done in the palliative care and bedridden uh, group of people. And there were another group where the active case finding was continued in um, you know, elderly and uh, you know, old age homes, et cetera. At the same time, for this, all people with the influenza-like illness or sudden acute respiratory infection, that's COVID symptoms, they actively screened, identified presumptive TB among them, tested them for TB and TB diagnosed. You could see the yield in this particular table. I would say that this group of people that ALI and science, who probably some of them would have been diagnosed if there were no COVID because they would have probably came and found out in that uh, passing case finding interventions. However, in this particular situation, going out to the community and searching for them and to find them, this was a high yielding intervention. You could just look at it uh, in another way. You could see that in the ILI and SARI, compared to the other ACF interventions, both the number of the GB proportion as well as the positivity rate was higher. As so you could see that ultimately the yield was high. And also the proportion of the people who were uh, able to be screened uh, among those math was also much higher among the ILA and SARI. You could see that uh, among the in, uh, people with symptoms of um, influenza-like illness, around 7% of them were um, uh, presumptive TB, and among them around 3% was found to be, um, you know, positive. And among those with the SARI, 14% of them were presumptive TB, and then 7% uh, were found to be uh, TB patient, TB. and uh, we could also see that uh, in this particular period there was a rapid expansion of rapid molecular sites and testing in India and in 2021 it is actually going even double this rate. So that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Nivas. So we heard about the bidirectional testing. So now uh, we go to contact investigation, what can be done, contact investigation in an integrated manner for COVID and TB. So Ricardo, if you can uh, start the video from uh, Sevim. We have Sevim from USAID. 
uh, doing this presentation. Thank you very much and uh, good day to everyone and thank you for everybody who uh, joined this uh, presentation today. So this, uh, uh, this part of the, uh, of the webinar, as, uh, as Saho mentioned, will uh, focus on the, uh, on, on the integrated contact investigation uh, response for, T uh, for TB and COVID-19. Uh, um, and, and COVID the previous uh, 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 speakers, it was mentioned uh, several times, how uh, contact investigation fits onto the, under the um, uh, current uh, uh, objectives of, uh, uh, of, of, of the uh, C19 uh, uh, RM. Uh, and, and, and really, uh, we, 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 looked at, uh, we looked at the contact investigation interventions as addressing the main uh, the three main objectives of that uh, uh, of, of C19 uh, uh, RM, both in terms of uh, providing uh, a, a, a solid uh, response to, uh, to 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 COVID uh, to COVID19, uh, in terms of the uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, detection and uh, testing for COVID19 patients. Uh, as well as really having a very strong impact on the mitigation of, 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 of COVID-19 um, uh, uh, impact on, 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 TB, on TB prevention and care, uh, as well as, uh, uh, as, well as uh, TB case finding, uh, as, 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 as what previously Saku showed at the beginning of the webinar, the devastating impact that COVID has had on the, on the TB. Uh, notifications and, and TB case finding in general, uh, and, and on the third side, uh, on the third objective, contact investigation interventions are uh, really critical um, um, uh, in, in strengthening the TB program's capacity uh, to to uh, to to uh, to respond to COVID nineteen through optimized resources and building um, uh, building search capacities. And in that, uh, uh, in that, uh, in that objective also, of course, is strengthening of the, uh, of the, of the community responses and uh, health system um, uh, responses in the, in, in, in the, in, in the countries. Um, we, 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 in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, 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 the, the, the critical, uh, uh, the critical part that contact investigation uh, can play in this um, uh, in this in this in this response, uh, we we do have uh, already quite a lot of lessons learned from uh, ongoing contact investigations and the platform the the contact investigation platforms that are built on the on, on the TB uh, clearly can be uh, can add value to the uh, to to the COVID nineteen. Uh, uh, response uh, to be able to mitigate both um, uh, the impact of COVID-19 on TB, advance the, the response to COVID-19, as I mentioned, but also uh, very critically uh, thinking about the, the, the future strengthening of this uh, platform through the integration of, of TB and COVID-19 contact investigation efforts, also build and strengthen the, uh, this platform for uh, future uh, uh, airborne pandemics and pathogens that uh, we know are also coming, um, and we need uh, we need to uh, to also be prepared for for, for those future emergencies. Uh, so uh, uh, similarly, uh, um, the implementation approach to integrated uh, uh, TB and COVID-19 contact investigation is included in the Global Fund information note. Um, as well as um, uh, it is it is it is it is linked through the Stop TB uh, uh, Stop TB Partnership uh, website, but uh, the approach is is, is uh, uh, the implementation approach is is, is uh, consists of three three main prongs, uh, so to speak. Uh, one is um, uh, we uh, we're looking at. Um, at um, the entry level being the uh, through the community and the household, as we know, um, uh, in terms of uh, our already established approach to TB contact um, uh, investigations, 
um, uh, a look uh, 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 the 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 the, the uh, activities uh, uh, that and interventions uh, uh, addressed at the at the household level. Um, the second prong is looking. We also know that contact investigations um, uh, uh, some 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 elements of it also conduct conducted at a at a health facility level and and there's also um uh, uh, uh opportunities for integration uh of COVID 19 and tb screening and testing and health and, and, and at health facilities the 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 third uh uh, uh, uh element that is really uh, critical and my colleague amy already uh um, uh, mentioned that it's, it's very important to have the integrated sample uh, referral and diagnostics um, that uh, that we use the opportunities as the uh, as as the screening as the screening is happening for TB uh, as well as for COVID nineteen that will also utilize these opportunities to co to collect and um, uh, specimens on site as possible. It is very, very important having both the community-based interventions uh, 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 and the health facility-based interventions to have uh, a very systematic approach and strong link, linkage established and, and, and built between the, these community and facility-based contact investigation uh, interventions. We know that without such a systematic uh, uh, approach, the integration of uh, uh, the integration and, and of, of TB and uh, COVID-19 um, uh, activities um, uh, will not be as effective and as efficient as we would like it, them to be. So, um, for uh, uh, in the implementation uh, uh, approach to integrated TB and COVID-19 um, contact investigation, we we have included. Um, uh, two specific illustrative uh, algorithms. Uh, as I said, you know, starting uh, with uh, TB and COVID-19 screening and testing at the uh, household level, using the opportunity that uh, 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 those interventions should include uh, uh, screening households uh, for, for, for COVID-19 uh, symptoms, uh, as well as uh, following up on the algorithm uh, and also uh, 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 screening and uh, 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 further evaluation for uh, tuberculosis uh, disease, uh, uh, given, as it was already mentioned, the similarities um, between the two diseases uh, in terms of um, uh, having um, um, uh, similar signs and symptoms. Um, uh, and, and and again to re to reiterate if 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 possible this this provides an opportunity I know in some countries um, uh, the collection of specimens uh, diagnostic specimens is happening on site but this is not the case in all in all of uh, in all of our countries but uh, in terms of having um, uh, 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 an effective response and an effective integration of these interventions it is critical. Uh, uh, to consider the field-based collection and integrated sample referral of uh, blood sputum uh, and uh, other specimens uh, that need to be obtained and, and, and uh, sent for further testing. Uh, the second uh, uh, illustrative uh, algorithm that we have uh, included in the, in the document is, is the facility level uh, contact investigation and, and COVID-19 um, uh, screening. So uh, this is it is important to 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 have uh, the systematic screening for active TB and COVID, and it should be implemented among all persons who are seeking healthcare upon entry uh, to the to the health facility. Uh, really, to um, uh, to to having that integrated. Um, uh, use the opportunities uh, through the uh, health facility entry points to do the screening uh, for both TB uh, and, and, and COVID-19, and then promptly uh, triaging um, of, of, of individuals with, uh, um, with signs and symptoms, and those should be uh, based on the WHO-defined symptoms criteria and respiratory or flu-like COVID-19 symptoms with, uh, with specific, uh, with specific uh, temperature checks. Um, in addition to um, uh, uh, to uh, uh, um, in addition to these uh, 
uh, uh, algorithms and uh, uh, that we have uh, uh, we have included. Um, another resource uh, document is, is is the costing uh, costing templates uh, to help uh, countries uh, estimate uh, uh, specific uh, costs associated with the integrated approach to TB and COVID-19 contact uh, investigations. So what you see on the screen is just uh, an example uh, that uh, we have used from uh, uh, from India uh, in this instance. And um, uh, it's it's a it's a streamlined uh, template with uh, inclusion of some major uh, uh, major major costs um, that are related to um, diagnostics uh, to uh, uh, testing. Uh, uh, um, uh, 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 drugs, as well as uh, very critically, uh, uh, we have included um, uh, estimates for uh, human resources, the need for human resources costs, uh, uh, both at, at both at uh, health facility levels, but very critically also uh, for community-based uh, for community-based uh, interventions. In addition to that, um, uh, the COVID testing costs, uh, as well as um, uh, uh, chest X-ray uh, estimates for uh, chest X-ray costs, uh, which which um, uh, are very important to have in the diagnostic uh, algorithms uh, for for screening and testing uh, for testing uh, as well. And just to say that um, uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, uh, the template, the, the structure of the template, it's, it is, uh, um, uh, some of these estimates are based on, uh, based on assumptions, uh, for example, what proportion of identified contacts, um, uh, uh, can be, um, uh, uh, can be, uh, screened, uh, uh, at, at a, at a country, at a country setting, as well as costs, uh, assumptions related to, to, to the, to, to the tests and the chest x-rays and the other, uh, equipment and also that it provides different scenarios whether uh, for example the screening uh, algorithms of contacts will include uh, testing for uh, TB infection for example uh, and use of shorter regimens and so on and so forth but just the main point uh, uh, here is that these assumptions are, are built in and they can be changed and adjusted based on the specific country situation and uh, feasibility of implementation and this costing uh, uh, template uh, is also is also available and will be shared um, uh, finally just to uh, just to wrap up um, it, what are the available resources since this is really uh, focused on uh, what can we do to speed up and develop uh, good applications for the c19 rm uh, 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 process uh, in addition to the COVID-19 contact tracing and TB contact investigation, this integrated implementation approach document that I mentioned and went briefly over the two specific algorithms that are proposed in this, in this document. Uh, we also have developed a programmatic implementation of TB contact investigation uh, document. It is a much larger document uh, focused uh, more like a implementation manual for TB specific contact investigation. But I think that document would be also very, uh, very, very helpful as we are scaling up uh, these interventions. And that document is also available through, uh, through our USAID site, as you can see on the, uh, uh, the link is also on the, on the on the on the screen and 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 thirdly as i mentioned the the the, the costing uh, template uh, to estimate to assist with estimating of uh, the integrated tb and covid 19 contact investigation activities is available as a separate document as well thank you very much thank you sevim that was on integrated contact investigation on contact tracing uh, now we have uh, uh, Viorel Sultan from uh, Stop TB Partnership and maybe supplemented by uh, James Malar if he's there uh, in, in one presentation. Uh, and uh, this is on community interventions. Viorel, please go ahead. Yes, we can see your slide. Go ahead. Thank you, uh, Saku. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, we heard from uh, Luchika, Sherry, uh, Mark, uh, and others uh, earlier that uh, engaging uh, uh, community and civil society and implementing community activities is a must. 
to be part of uh, this application. So uh, uh, James and I will go uh, quickly through some resources that uh, uh, we believe will help you to build a successful application uh, to the Global Fund. Uh, Ricardo, next slide, please. So um, um, you know that in 2020, uh, United Nations Secretary General issued a report in terms of uh, uh, assessing the progress uh, of the high-level commitments. Uh, uh, and, uh, and the report uh, uh, basically uh, mentioned that uh, it is uh, a, a paramount important to uh, mitigate uh, uh, COVID impact on TB and ensure that TB prevention and KA are uh, safeguarded. And um, uh, uh, together with many of you, uh, uh, we uh, also worked on a complementary uh, community uh, monitoring report, which is called a deadly divide TV communities uh, versus uh, TV commitments versus TV realities, um, uh, which uh, basically uh, are saying that uh, is saying that uh, um, uh, COVID nineteen should be used as an opportunity and not as an excuse that the commitments uh, are not uh, met. Uh, you have the uh, links here, so uh, these two documents can uh, uh, serve you as a good basis uh, for um, uh, building the application to the Global Fund. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, Ketevan and, and Sahu earlier uh, mentioned about the uh, specific uh, uh, package of documents uh, uh, that have been uh, published by the Global Fund uh, to, uh, for this uh, specific call for proposals. Um, uh, I would like to stress your attention on a uh, uh, on a additional uh, information note, which is also developed by the Global Fund together with uh, the partners. Um, uh, for uh, COVID-19 catch-up plans. So uh, you will uh, see in this document, which is also on the uh, web page of uh, the Global Fund, uh, there is a, um, uh, there is a, a lot of uh, 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 um, uh, places where the uh, community and civil society uh, uh, role is uh, mentioned. Uh, so please use this information note as, uh, note as a guide again for um, uh, building the successful application to the Global Fund. Specifically, you will find uh, um, uh, this language around the legal gender uh, uh, and uh, vulnerable populations barriers. We need to know them and we need to develop specific activities to overcome them. We need to have a specific systems to ensure social support, especially on COVID. Uh, we need to uh, sustain commitments and resources that are, they are not um, uh, uh, moved out from um, the uh, TB um, response, uh, ensuring inclusive and accessible health care. Uh, we heard a lot about diagnostics uh, earlier um, uh, from my colleagues, as well as uh, 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 the importance of uh, um, uh, TB affected community and civil society participation in monitoring. Next slide, slide, please. In uh, the application package, uh, you will see a few uh, documents there, and I would like to stress your attention on the application form itself. There are several specific uh, sections in that application that uh, needs a specific attention, especially in uh, related to the engagement of uh, TB affected community and civil society. Uh, starting from the beginning, uh, 211 uh, is the context where we need to include the role of the civil society in COVID-19 response, and we should make and, and, and we should make sure that uh, the um, uh, TB uh, community is part of that. Uh, the section uh, 212, which is stakeholder engagement, again, TB affected community and civil society. Uh, uh, part of, the, of that, and we need to uh, clearly uh, describe the role and, and, uh, and uh, uh, the engagement. Um, uh, uh, the section 232 uh, two, uh, is about detailing uh, service disruption 
And it's important, uh, uh, we mentioned the TB key and vulnerable populations there. And uh, two, three, four, you will uh, see uh, a specific uh, uh, section on human rights stigma and gender related issues and barriers. And again, we need to be to ensure that TB is part of, uh, of this uh, as well. Uh, when uh, talking about the modular tem template of the Global Fund, you will see specific modules there and, um, and um, uh, where you can reflect uh, 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 your um, activities related to TB, community, TB affected community and uh, civil society. It is about uh, uh, case management where, uh, where we uh, need to uh, describe what Luchika said from the beginning. Um, uh, how the community will support uh, the response uh, uh, on COVID and mitigation uh, of uh, COVID impact on TB, especially when it is about uh, uh, working as a, uh, a community uh, squad in a way and uh, doing outreach and bringing services closer to people. And uh, you will see even there that there is a possibility to include specific uh, 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 fee, for, uh, fee for services there and salaries. Uh, so um, mitigation, uh, the uh, specific model on mitigation of TB, uh, uh, gender-based violence. Again, we need to ensure that uh, um, uh, women affected by TB and women from key and vulnerable populations linked to TB are there and, re and well reflected. You will see human rights stigma and gender module. Uh, you will see community-led uh, uh, monitoring uh, um, where TB affected community and civil society are key uh, to implement community-led research and advocacy, social mobilization, capacity building. So all these documents allows you uh, to build a successful application and include uh, as a keystone uh, uh, TB community and, affect and uh, civil society role uh, in all of this. And just to mention that we have a specific uh, uh, a, a, a possibility to apply for above allocation requests. Do not leave all these uh, uh, community work only in above allocation because this is not right. We need to put in the basic uh, application and use above allocation uh, wisely to increase the possibility to um, uh, scale up uh, and engage more. Um, I will stop here and will turn to my colleague um, uh, James Muller to uh, uh, go uh, quickly through other resources as well. Thank you. Thanks so much, Virel, um, and appreciate that. I think it's obviously it's obviously key. What we've got so far from the presentation is that, firstly, that we need to find the connections and leverage um, these COVID investments and interventions to strengthen TB responses. And secondly, you've seen from the last slide Virel just touched on that the application form and the modular template is set up in a way for you to do that. There is a lot of opportunity, as Virel detailed, on the types of things that you can put in place. I'll add to some of the things that VRL said, and you can see on the screen, a report that's called the impact of COVID-19 on the TB uh, epidemic, a community perspective. And I note that this was one of the, the first efforts that really tried to understand um, the, at the grassroots and community level, what, what was the impact and what were the types of things that we needed to understand um, and what was the relationship between TB and COVID. And what we could see from this report is it was everything from diagnostics to human resources to funding. And so as VRL had detailed on the previous screen, these are all things which fit very strongly in, in this upcoming funding request opportunity. Uh, next slide. I note as well, and this, this also fits quite, quite well with the points that VRL was making, that we've seen an increased mortality in people with both TB and COVID-19. And so there is this opportunity to ensure that the types of support services that you're putting into the funding request are complementary and leveraging or applicable to both responses. And a third area, which I think is particularly important in this context of, of CRG is very much around this idea of enabling environments. And what are the enabling environments that we need for both COVID and TB health responses to be effective? And three things that have come out very strongly in, in a lot of the um, evidence so far is on areas of stigma and discrimination, on mental health support, as well as other social protection systems, and on broader human rights and gender-related barriers. 
both those uh, barriers that were previously existing that have subsequently been exacerbated in the TB response because of COVID-19, but also some new ones that have also happened as a result of national responses uh, to COVID as well. Uh, next slide. So one of the things that, that you've sort of heard a little bit about uh, the, the, the relationship between the two, the fact that you, your application form links the two. So here's some TB CRG investment packages that have been developed. They've been developed um, more specifically for, for TB and CRG, but we note that there is an opportunity for many of them to be adapted specifically to be relevant to this COVID response as well. And I wanted to bring your attention to a couple of them in particular. Firstly, um, the, the, the first one looks at um, TB, COVID and prisons. And I, I use this one more as an example for, for encouraging you to think about key and vulnerable populations and the nuance that can be included in the funding request. Um, the second one, very much around stigma measurement and reduction. And this is like a tool which also can be, we can work with you to help adapt to, to be relevant to both TB and COVID. And a third area is on community-led monitoring. This is, can we know that community-led monitoring has been uh, an incredible evidence of, of real-time data? And this is something that we need to continue to scale up um, and link it to the relevant capacity building and support uh, in all of the uh, funding requests coming at country level. The reason these investment packages are useful is they're not just ideas around interventions, but they give you the rationale they give you intervention guidance and they give you costings. And this is really key because we know in the past that people intend to include CRG interventions, but sometimes struggle to understand how to budget them and how to frame them. Uh, next slide, please. So I just want to conclude in the last couple of seconds that I've got here before my timer goes off. Um, we know that this, uh, the impact here has been very significant. And as you've heard that from several of the presentations, we know that existing human rights and gender related barriers have been exacerbated and new barriers have emerged. That we know that TBCRG is, is central uh, to the Global Fund information note on TB catch up plans, and as are the six calls to action under the deadly divide. And so there's an importance and an opportunity here to, to really think about how best to integrate these at the country level. And we're very much ready to help support that. And then finally, some of the TB CRG investment packages that were on the previous slide present some ideas for how to do that practically, how to operationalize some of these ideas and how to ensure that you can get support, investment and funding for these CRG activities that can help strengthen both TB and COVID responses at national level. Thanks very much. Thank you, Biorel, and thank you, James. Uh, now we come to the presentation on what technical support is available to countries to articulate what we all discussed here as a good proposal from a country for C19RM. So we have uh, uh, Alex from USAID uh, who will be talking about uh, this technical support that is available. Ricardo, if you can play Alex video. So um, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, to this uh, webinar. Um, as Sachem mentioned, my name is Alex Goldkopf. I'm a, a senior TB advisor at uh, USID Washington uh, TB division. Um, and I'm one of the persons that is, uh, who is managing the uh, short-term technical assistance, STTA at uh, TB division. So um, today um, I have just a few slides to uh, present um, how um, USID can support um, you guys, NTP, Minister of Health and CCM members with application to the Global Fund for the C19RM um, applications. Uh, so first, uh, let me just mention that um, uh, and show on the screen a list of countries. It's a pretty uh, large list um, of countries where um, USID working and uh, we're providing technical assistance. Um, there are two different lists. Uh, the first one, what you see, uh, it's uh, USID uh, countries where uh, USID has uh, TB bilateral programs. It means that USAID missions uh, um, receive uh, funds uh, on annual basis and uh, program those funds in, uh, uh, in countries, in those countries that is listed on a screen on the first uh, group of countries. And we do have active TB uh, projects, activities um, in the countries, with, as well as we do have um, USAID staff in USAID missions in those countries who are responsible for 
for TB. And then um, you, um, if you are based in those countries, you you know your colleagues from USID, you uh, talking to them probably on a daily basis, so you are well, very well aware of that situation. Um, second group of countries at um, where USID is working, but we do not have TB programs in there. Uh, we do not have TB money in, the, in those countries. Um, however, those countries, um, they do have USID presence. Uh, some of them, they have USID health activities. Um, some of them may not. Some of them may have different activities. But um, still, uh, we, uh, as a TB division, we are responsible for providing uh, technical assistance for TB uh, to those countries related to uh, Global Fund. So it's actually um, the same applies to the um, C19 RM. If you are in those um, uh, countries, uh, second group of countries, um, you are also can request and um, utilize assistance from, from USID uh, Washington for this uh, support for the Global Fund. And then as you see total, we have uh, 55 countries that we are um, working with um, providing uh, technical support. So for the uh, Global Fund, uh, the COVID response for the C19RM, short-term technical assistance, uh, assistance STTA, um, the goals and objectives. The goal, of course, is to mitigate um, COVID-19 impact on TB programs. Um, objectives is um, to support assist um, CCMs, NTPs, and you guys, Minister of Health, with the application to the Global Fund, um, support countries to develop Related, uh, related strategies, um, policies, guidelines is related to uh, COVID and TB, and of course, um, assist and help with implementation of those grants and programs um, to achieve uh, goals and targets set in the, in the application. Um, so um, this is the most important slide. Uh, it describes the steps, how, um, how to engage, how to get um, uh, support, how to get technical assistance. Um, for uh, this global fund uh, uh, COVID response uh, funding. Um, the first step is um, 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 for CCM or NTP or Minister of Health, um, uh, you, ha you have a few, few options um, on uh, what to, how to start, how to engage, how to initiate this technical assistance request. Um, if you have your USAID mission in a country where uh, you have, you know, you know your part, you have, you know, your USAID colleagues in the, in the mission, uh, is if you are based in the country where we do have USID TB presence, a TB project, uh, the first group of countries that I showed. Um, it's uh, the easiest way for you will be to just to contact your um, USID colleagues at the, uh, at the mission and ask for uh, technical support, for technical assistance. Um, um, or you can um, go directly to Stop TB Partnership. Um, or um, <clears throat> the last option is to go directly to USID Washington. And for that, you need to send email to this um, email address. It's on the screen. Um, if you do not have your um, uh, house office, um, uh, if you do not have in your country your CID TB project, um, in this case, of course, you can um, just go directly to Stop TB or to your city Washington. <clears throat> um, in this case, and I will um, read it out for you. The email address is uh, usidtba at usid.gov. So that's uh, email address in, in red. Um, that's an uh, um, automatic um, email address. What it means is that once you send email, um, very short, uh, just a two sentences email to this uh, email address, you'll get autom uh, automatic response from the system with a link uh, to, a, to a Google form. And that uh, you need to click on that link and then fill in the uh, UTA request. It's a very short form, maybe one page long, takes you maybe five minutes. Um, to fill in the request. Um, the, the form is, will ask you um, which, uh, what country you are from, what type of support you need, um, what dates of the support, um, just very basic questions in the language um, of the consultant that you're looking for. And once we get that um, uh, form submitted to us, uh, we monitor those forms and emails uh, on a daily basis. Once we have that form uh, coming to us, then we will start uh, engaging with you and um, depends, again, if we do have USAID presence in the country, we will work with USAID mission and then supporting you. Um, if not, we will work directly directly with, with you uh, from, from, uh, from our headquarters. Um, so once um, that um, uh, TA comes to us, to TB division, um, uh, we are um, uh, uh, analyzing those TAs, as I mentioned, at our 
um, SDK team. Um, we have a pool of consultants um, that are specifically selected for the Global Fund application for this uh, um, round of C19RM applications. Uh, we just had a um, kind of briefing like this webinar for, uh, for uh, consultants just yesterday. Um, so we are, uh, based on the country request, based on the specifics of the request, um, we're looking at, uh, we're selecting a few um, candidates from that database that we have together with Top TV. And then we communicate back a few options to you guys, uh, to the country. Um, and again, it depends um, uh, um, um, who we're talking with, if it's uh, US admission or it's NTP or it's CCM, doesn't matter. But um, uh, at the country level, uh, I think it's already been mentioned by Safu and by, uh, by, by other colleagues that because it's a joint request by country together with all three diseases, CCM um, and COVID response team. So um, it has to be somehow kind of managed and organized. Uh, the same as uh, selection for technical assistance has to be organized in that way. So once uh, you um, country received a few options uh, from uh, from um, uh, um, uh, from us, then uh, I mean uh, we will receive names and uh, CVs of the consultants. You will have a chance to review them and then select the best um, that you um, uh, prefer. Um, you can interview those consultants if you like to. You can send them a mail and, and discuss details. Um, feel free to do, do that. Um, and then uh, once you select them, uh, you will uh, inform us and then we will um, uh, ask a hiring mechanism, hiring project that will actually hire those consultants and then deploy to you. Uh, I will talk about that a little bit later in the next slide. So once a consultant is in, in, uh, uh, deployed um, in person uh, or virtually, then it's your consultant. Uh, we are no longer involved in that, in that process. Um, uh, it's your consultant. Please work with a consultant on a daily basis, uh, communicate, work together, uh, set uh, um, deliverables for consultant, monitor his progress or, he, or her progress, um, engage consultant uh, with uh, all partners. Um, if it's, um, uh, if you have, if we have USAID mission in the country, please engage USAID mission as well. Um, because, um, as, as I think it was mentioned this morning, this um, at the beginning of the uh, webinar, is that USID is um, um, receiving will receive um, uh, separate COVID funds, which will go to missions. So, in in order to kind of avoid duplication and make sure it's the response is coordinated, um, USID uh, funds and global fund funds for COVID, it's important for um, USID mission to be involved in those discussions. Um, when consultant is a helping country. And then once uh, the technical assistance is finished um, and the consultant finishes with his uh, report, then we will follow up with the country, with you guys on the quality assurance. We will send you a quality survey asking for your experience and asking for your recommendations and feedback so that we can improve uh, improve technical, technical assistance. So, um, 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 and then, um, uh, in terms of like a projects and mechanism and uh, pool of consultants, as I mentioned, we have uh, consultants selected for the uh, Global Fund um, application processes. Um, most of the consultants have experience um, uh, writing Global Fund applications. Um, uh, um, um, we have two um, uh, mechanisms that we will use to hire consultants. Um, one of them is, of course, the TV partnership. Um, so the partnership has um, a lot of uh, consultants on the roster um, that supporting um, global fund, supporting MDRTB response, supporting TV response, uh, content investigation, uh, of course, consultants involved in, in GDF uh, work. So all kinds of consultants. Um, so and we, we we hope that your requests will uh, we will help you with your request for support. Um, also, we have consultants uh, uh, we hire through uh, USAID project. It's called GH Times. Um, uh, some of the consultants will be uh, kind of employed through that project um, as well, in addition to Stop TV. Um, and then, and lastly, uh, just to mention that uh, um, it is possible for, for a country, for CCM, for NTP, for you guys, uh, to offer a proposed your own consultant. Um, that's also possible. Um, um, again, we because of uh, the COVID times, uh, consultants cannot travel, and of course, it's preference for. A consultant to be uh, based in the country um, and supporting country on a daily basis. I know um, ideally having access to data, having access to our partners, having access to you know uh, COVID response team. So 
um, feel free to uh, also propose your own consultant, that's fine. Um, uh, ideally, uh, you would have some kind of selection process at a country level when you will uh, review a few uh, applicants, few consultants and select the best one. Um, and ideally you interview the person before you, um, <clears throat> before you um, um, uh, proceed uh, and, and, and share um, the name and email with us. Uh, once it's done, uh, we will, uh, of course, um, the, um, ask Stock TV or JH Tams to hire a consultant, and then he will um, be uh, deployed. Um, the only downside is that because it's a new consultant to us, uh, it will take two to three weeks um, to hire the person. In this case, it's a new person. So um, because of uh, turnaround time is very short for the application um, or the, for Global Fund, uh, make sure you start this process very soon, uh, like you know, today, to, today, tomorrow, um, and then uh, uh, um, kind of uh, stay ahead of the game, uh, select consultant and uh, share the name um, very, very quickly. So then uh, it takes, because again, as I said, it takes time to, to bring a consultant on board in this case. So that's it, that's my, my last slide. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions if you, if you have. Thank you, Alex. Uh, so um, uh, we have uh, come to the end of all the presentations and I see that the time allocated to this webinar is also over uh, two hours time. Uh, there was a very lively chat and we encourage that. And uh, if you have more questions, comments, please uh, reach out to us at uh, Stop TV. We would be happy to facilitate uh, and uh, answer as much as we can and also connect you to people uh, who can answer the rest of your questions. Now, just to uh, conclude uh, uh, with some uh, take home messages, I will not take much time, but just remind you on uh, four things. And number one is that this is a great opportunity to recover from the enormous amount of uh, damage that has happened uh, to the TB responses in terms of uh, people treated uh, and also scale up further. Uh, we saw the three objectives and the three information note and very clear messages up front by Luchika and Mark uh, and Eliwood that we can connect proposals to all the three objectives, not just the mitigation of TB part, but also the other two. Uh, the, the next point I wanted to make is uh, uh, we have to be mindful that the ambition has to be set at the right level. We have seen that it is not easy to recover from the declines in case notification. Something at scale and dramatic has to happen if countries have to recover from the impact. We should not underestimate the, the, the future uh, possible COVID uh, waves that may come. So very important here to remember to ask what you need and if it is fine, if, it, if you are told it cannot be provided the finances, but it will be, I think, not correct to not ask and regret later. So that's on the ambition level. Then the last bit is on speed. I think many people uh, refer to speed, including Alex in his last slide was saying, we start tomorrow. So uh, uh, you heard from Global Fund, this is an emergency funding uh, opportunity. So we should act with speed we saw how the world acted with speed with vaccines in 10 months time. It was researched, produced, procured, implemented and into people's harm, arms now going uh, in countries in different speed. So I think the, the speed is also very important from the TB perspective uh, to match that. So I, I would uh, uh, end there. Uh, uh, we didn't have enough time for uh, 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 discussion, but I think the chat, chat was quite lively. The purpose was to inform you all about all these things that have rapidly developed and hope we have been able to do that. Please, please reach out to us if you have any further comments and uh, questions. All the presentations as well as the webinar will be available for people to download. And we have your uh, email addresses because all of you were uh, registered in the system. So thank you so much for participating. I, I thank also our team here, all the speakers, and especially Ricarda uh, and Mahmoud who were at the, uh, you know, who were managing the connections and everybody who uh, joined uh, and the speakers and people who responded to the chat from Stop TV as well as uh, from Global Fund. We are here further available for any support uh, for the countries and partners. Thank you so much and uh, have a good day.
or good evening. Bye.